to my channel, Zyla here, and today we're gonna be making this super trippy, awesome Mobius strip violin, like an infinite violin. This is an idea I've had like murking around in my brain for over two years now. Um, I have actually never procrastinated on a project as hard as I have procrastinated on this one. I think it is finally time for me to make an attempt at my dream Mobius electric violin. So let's do it. So before I start cutting actual wood, I glued up these plywood scrap blanks that are the same, roughly the same size as the stock I'm gonna be using. I just wanna make sure that the machine is doing what I want it to be doing. So this project is really CNC heavy and it's honestly not a project I probably would have considered without access to my Tormach router, but a common misconception that bothers me a lot is how CNC is cheating and it's easier and I would argue that it's not. It's just a completely different skill set, but it's a skill set that deserves just as much respect. And for me, it's actually a lot harder and like more anxiety inducing than doing things the old school way like I did with my electric bass. I am so nervous. I don't know why, because it's just a scrap piece. I think I did it. That was Magical. I have seen this type of CNC work done before, but like most of what I do is in 2D and it's like fine. This is so cool. So what I think I'm gonna do is actually paint a thin coat of epoxy over this to stabilize it, because especially because it's plywood and I do want the test run to work. But if that works well, I might do that to the real thing as well. The way I modeled this to be flipped over is using dowel holes. So you'll see that there are two centered holes that I drilled all the way through the piece and into the spoil board below it. And then once the first side is cut, I can stick dowels into those holes and flip it over so that the milling operation aligns on the second side. And once that was done, I could pop it off the machine and cut the tabs and see how it looks. I was shocked to find it successful on the first try. So it was time to grab my hard maple, put on my big girl pants and cut the blank. I am not gonna lie, it doesn't really get less nerve wracking each time I need to hit go on this machine. But the first side looked okay and I flipped it over to run the second side. The maple is so much more stable than the plywood so I didn't feel the need to reinforce it with epoxy and it held up okay. And for these roughing passes, I'm using a quarter inch upcut end mill and then a ball nose end mill for the finishing pass. The final piece definitely had a lot more flaws than the plywood prototype, probably just like a poor adjustment of feeds and speeds on my part to accommodate for how much harder the maple is than the plywood, but I decided it was passable with some good elbow grease finish work, aka sanding, just a lot of sanding. Cover your mistakes with sandpaper. <laughs> The non-Mobius side was a whole lot easier, at least to program, and I just did it in a single operation with that quarter inch end mill. Although I did still manage to break it, but it was nothing that some glue won't fix. So shh, I won't tell if you don't tell. <laughs> and then it was back into my cam dungeon to do the middle piece, which is what makes this silly little Mobius strip an actual violin. Anyway, if you ignore the mess that is my desk, I think that this is an awesome chance to introduce you to the sponsor of today's video, Autodesk, a design and make company. Autodesk is the creator of Fusion, the CAD and CAM software that I always use. Genuinely, it's actually what I do all of my CAD in. And for a project like this, CAD is absolutely imperative. An accurate and detailed 3D model is necessary for my little robot employee to cut from. Not only that, but Autodesk Fusion has CAM, or computer-aided machining, built in, which means I can program all of my toolpaths directly from my model without ever leaving the software, which is what I'm doing right now. I have all of my tools and their respective feeds and speeds saved, which makes creating new models a breeze. I also want to give a huge shout out to them for going above and beyond as a sponsor as well. When I was really struggling with this project and burnout in general, they lent me an engineering mentor who really showed me a ton of tricks, built up my confidence in CAD, helped me clean up my model, and changed the way that I think about CNC work. And that one-on-one -on -one mentorship is kind of what really pushed this project over the finish line. So if you're looking for CAD software, I genuinely can't recommend Autodesk Fusion enough. Anyway, with my cam in hand, it was time to cut down my stock for this middle piece. All right, today is the day. It's happening. I'm gonna stop procrastinating. I'm gonna get this neck cut. I'm gonna cut another of the Mobius rib because I don't love the way the last one turned out. I think the piece might've shifted a little, so I'll screw it down better. 
and I'm going to get this vibe, like, I am going to make progress. I have to stop procrastinating. It is a balmy 75 degrees and sunny out, and it will just be, it will be 75 to 78 degrees and sunny for the next week and a half, and I will get so much stuff done. I'm like a house plant. I require sunlight and water, but mostly sunlight, and if I don't have that, I wilt. But I have it, so I'm out of excuses. We're doing it. Anyway, with my cam in hand, it was time to cut down my stock for this middle piece. Since this piece was too thick for any of my bits to cut all the way through, I programmed it to go halfway on each side. And for the dowel holes, I just match drilled them with a regular drill before pulling the piece up from the spoil board. Also, I feel the need to note that yes, my dust collection works. I just leave it up while I'm filming so that the time lapse looks nicer on video. Do not fret. happening wow look at the finish right off the CNC all right I'm really excited because surf prep sent me their like detail sander um, and I, I feel like it's gonna be perfect for for this because I don't want to take off too much material I need it to be soft so it can get around the curves so let's give it a try my sanding setup has really upped its game over the years, and between my Festival Orbital that I already had, hand blocks, and this new surf prep, it was so easy to like knock off big sections with the Festool and then go through things with the hand block, and then all of the curves and details were a breeze with this new surf prep sander. Today is gonna be really fun because I have a lot of tiny detail work that I've been putting off, but I accidentally drank like twice my daily intake of coffee this morning, so I'm a little bit jitterier than usual, so we'll see how it goes. I disassembled the jack mount and decided to keep the plastic piece the jack fits into and just shape it to sleekly mount to the skeleton body of this violin. Then it was time to carve out the peg box. Now, this was in an axis that the CNC couldn't get to without a third operation, which I decided wasn't worth it. And plus, I needed to get some hand tool time in on this build. So this ended up being probably my favorite afternoon working on this violin, just listening to Hilary Hahn play Bach and chiseling away. And while I was at the bench, I also shaped the fingerboard, nut, and the saddle. But I did kind of a terrible job, which we'll learn later in this video. I just, I had no idea what I was doing. I also drilled the hole for the end pin to seat into. And on an acoustic violin, this hole is reamed into the tail block and then the end button is kept in through tension and friction. But since I had to shorten the end pin and the violin structure is just generally not the same, I decided to just glue it in. And since it's electric, the rules were already out the window in the first place. <laughs> Once I shortened the end pin, I drilled a few small holes in the side just to give the epoxy something to grab onto. Then I mixed up a batch of epoxy, tinted it black to match the ebony, and the drop of red warms up the black color to closer to wood tone, and glued all of my ebony pieces on. So the end pin, fingerboard, nut, saddle, and the jack mount. But man, did the luthiers I brought this to later on give me endless for epoxying anything at all. <laughs> all right, so one of the hardest things I've had to learn over the years is that at this point, the best thing I can do is walk away. This is thickened epoxy, so it's not gonna sag, it's not gonna go anywhere. If I stay here, I'm gonna keep seeing little imperfections and I'm gonna poke at it and I'm gonna make it worse. So it is bedtime. It's morning. And that means this guy is cured. I shaped and sanded the fingerboard to fit the neck a bit, trimmed the nut down so the action of the strings isn't too high. I got it super glossy with the surf prep like high grit foam pads and then it was time to glue the sides on. I epoxied the maple pieces on it as well, which was not a bad idea. And you'll notice for all the gluing that I'm doing, I mask off the area around it so the squeeze out doesn't make a mess of things. I can just peel it off. And since the chin rest doesn't have enough material to clamp onto the traditional way, I just epoxied that down too. You may be noticing a theme here, which uh, some of you may call it impatience solved with epoxy, and uh, you also might be right. <laughs> Today is the last day of this build. And I decided to make an appointment with a local violin shop to help me shape the bridge and the pegs because 
I know that the like mojo on YouTube is like, you have to be the one that does everything. And there are gonna be so many people in my comments that are like, you're not a real maker if you couldn't figure it out. But the reality is luthery is one of the art forms that I respect the most. Like I think luthiers are so cool and so amazing. And like the rest of this instrument is pretty sacrilege. Like it's just, a violin shaped piece of wood, but shaping the bridge and the pegs and like tuning it up, that's what makes an instrument an instrument. And luthery is an art that has been passed from master to apprentice for hundreds of years and just jumping in and being like, I can do it because I watched a YouTube video about it feels really disrespectful to an art form that I admire. So um, I'm taking it into a violin shop. I just found one that will take me today. I got a give this its final sanding, get a co couple coats of shellac on here, and then make it into an instrument. With instruments, I've really taken a liking to spray on shellac, and a luthier friend of mine suggested it, and it's just so easy to use, and it requires no sanding between coats, although I do tend to sand with a really high grit right before my last coat, just to give it a really beautiful shine. Well, we made it. Let's see what they say. I brought this sacrilegious little fiddle to Robert Cower Violins in Hollywood, and they were awesome. They were so supportive and knowledgeable and not judgmental of all of my stupid mistakes, although they certainly gave me some very friendly ribbing over all of the dumb things I did. I've said it many times on my channel, but the opportunity to work with true masters of their craft remains my favorite part of my job. I walked in and within 30 seconds of looking and also talking to me, Robert Cower was like, you're nuts in the wrong place. Fingerboard's gonna buzz. These pegs aren't gonna fit. Let's just like wind this back, start over a little bit. And they spent the afternoon teaching me so much. And Josh, one of their luthiers, even let me sit at his bench and use his tools and like coach me on how to do things properly. As a side note, Robert Cower brought the violin to the back and like all of the guys were really excited to just help and like work on this weird thing. So like a bunch of them helped me chisel my old nut off along with instructions to never ever epoxy a nut on again. Um, they helped me shape a new nut, like re-measure all the distances from like my bridge to my nut and my bridge to my saddle. Um, and they helped me reshape my entire fingerboard. <laughs> Back at my own shop, I decided to try to make forward progress on my own by shaping the pegs and reaming the peg holes. But once I got back, they convinced me to use gear pegs, so I shouldn't have done that anyway. Oh well. Like I said, luthery is not to be trifled with. Back at the Robert Cower violin shop, Josh helped me ream the peg holes and fit the pegs, which involved using the cutest little chop saw I have ever seen. <laughs> With the pegs in, we moved on to bridge shaping. And I am not gonna lie, I am always one for DIYing everything. However, if you are building a violin, just take the bridge in to a violin shop. Like, I'm not even gonna try to explain how it should be done here. It is an art form, it requires a lot of experience, and it really affects the way the instrument plays. And you should learn to do it from a master and not some random chick on YouTube who is building her first violin. But I will let you watch a master at work here. For the first string up, we used old throwaway strings that Josh uses on like every single violin that he, he works on. And these are basically used as a, ga like as a gauge so that we can check everything and file the grooves into the bridge without risking accidentally filing your real strings. And this little bit of parchment just protects the wood of the bridge from the tiny little E string cutting into it over time. I drilled a hole all the way through the instrument for the pickup wire to pass through and then meet the output jack, and then we could string it up for real. And when I got home, all there was left to do was solder the pickup to the jack and find an amp to test it out. Hi, Hi guys. 